Okay. Here's a poem called The Star Market. There's somebody from Rochester here. Where are you? Oh, someone else. The Star Market. Remember? Remember? <laughs> the Star Market. This is for the monks. The people Jesus loved were shopping at the Star Market yesterday. An old lead-colored man standing next to me at the checkout breathed so heavily I had to step back a few steps. Even after his bags were packed, he still stood, breathing hard and hawking into his hand. The feeble, the lame, I could hardly look at them. Shuffling through the aisles, they smelled of decay, as if the star market had declared a day off for the able-bodied, and I had wandered in with the rest of them. Sour milk, bad meat, looking for cereal and spring water. Jesus must have been a saint, I said to myself, looking for my lost car in the parking lot later, stumbling among the people who would have been lowered into rooms by ropes, who would have crept out of caves or crawled from the corners of public baths on their hands and knees, begging for mercy. If I touch only the hem of his garment, one woman thought. Could I bear the look on his face when he wheels around? I didn't know that story about Spain, Koshin. It's very moving to me um, how we're all so connected before we even meet, you know. Um, my life changed um, when my brother John, who was 11 years younger than I, um, found out he had the AIDS virus. It was in the 80s. It's when people died um, quickly, often. And um, <clears throat> John actually did die, and he came back from the dead. He was one of those people. Um, he clinically died and then came back. And um, I want to read this poem. It's called For Three Days. And it's about that, when that happened. There's two references. One is to um, Mary and Martha. Remember those great sisters of Lazarus? Um, uh, you know, Lazarus is sick. He's a good friend of Jesus. They send for Jesus. Jesus says, I'll be there in a couple of days. They send again for him. He says, I'll be there in a couple of days. And he arrives too late. Lazarus has died. And in the gospel, both of the sisters, each in their turn, when they see Jesus come into the house, say the line I quote in here. <clears throat> the other uh, allusion is to Schrodinger's cat, and somebody here can probably uh, explain that physics theory. I'm sure. <laughs> right? You all know that? The, the, it's a cool idea. We, we've absorbed it, even though you may not know it. We used to think that reality was this. Remember? When we used to think this table was actually here? <laughs> it was only about 20 years ago, I think. <laughs> 30, right? We used to think this was a table. And it was a table whether I saw it or not. You know, it was a table. It was a table. It was a thing, right? And then Schrodinger came along, and he invented, he created this theory, which was where you put a cat in a box with a little vial of radioactive something, and the cat either knocked the thing over, and it's dead, or the cat didn't, and it's still alive. But according to this, I'm reducing this theory, but according to this idea, the cat is both alive and dead until someone opens the box and looks to see. It has to do with perception creating reality and what we call reality. <clears throat> My brother's name is John. For three days now, I've been trying to find another word for gratitude because my brother could have died and didn't. 
because for a week we stood in the intensive care unit trying not to imagine how it would be then, afterwards. My youngest brother, Andy, said, this is so weird. I don't know if I'll be talking with John today or buying a pair of pants for his funeral. And I hated him for saying it because it was true and seemed to tilt it because I had been writing his elegy in my head during the seven hour drive there and trying not to. Thinking meant not thinking. It meant imagining my brother surrounded by light, like Schrodinger's cat that would be dead if you looked and might live if you didn't. And then it got better, and then it got worse, and it's a story now. He came back, and I did, by that time, imagine him dead. And I did begin to write the other story, how the crowd in the stifling church snapped to a tearful attention, how my brother lived again for a few minutes through me. And although I know I couldn't help it, because fear has its own language and its own story, because even grief provides a living remedy, I can't help but think of that woman who said to him whom she considered her savior, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. How she too might have practiced her speech and how she too might have stood trembling, unable to meet the eyes of the dear familiar figure that stumbled from the cave when the compassionate fist of God opened and crushed her with gratitude and shame. I was thinking about suffering. We were in um, Joshua Moses' wonderful workshop, and um, I wanted to read a poem by Emily Dickinson the great poet of extreme states. Emily Dickinson was able to speak, find the unspeakable, um, somehow sayable. So here's one of her great poems. You probably know this. I felt a funeral in my brain, and mourners to and fro kept treading, treading till it seemed that sense was breaking through. And when they all receded, a service like a drum kept beating, beating, till I thought my mind was going numb. And then I heard them lift a box and creak across my soul with those same boots of lead again. Then space began to toll as all the heavens were a bell and being but an ear and I and silence some strange race wrecked solitary here and then a plank in reason broke and I dropped down and down and hit a world with every plunge and finished knowing then poetry knows that we're both living and dying at the same time that's one of the great great things about poetry I wish I could have heard BJ's talk earlier today but poetry holds this knowledge um, that we are alive and that one day we will not be alive. It's able to hold that knowledge. Um, so I wanted to, um, to read you a couple more poems with John in them. The last time, the last time we had dinner together 
in a restaurant with white tablecloths. He leaned forward and took my two hands in his hands and said, I'm, go I'm going to die soon. I want you to know that. And I said, I think I do know. And he said, what surprises me is that you don't. And I said, I do. And he said, what? And I said, know that you're going to die. And he said, no. I mean, know that you are. <laughs> Does anybody here have a phobia? What's your phobia? Snakes. What's your phobia? Me too. Do you ride the subway? You're so good. I can't do it. I'm claustrophobic. I can't get on a subway. Somebody else? Yeah. Elevators. My sister in claustrophobia, right? What? Rats. Anybody in the back? Phobias? Yeah, well, do you live in New York? Anybody else? Who has the weirdest phobia in the whole room? What? I'm, caterpillars? Ticks? What's a tick caterpillar? Oh, tent. Excuse me. Well, that's an understandable phobia. <laughs> tent caterpillars. Um, how some of it happened is about a phobia that my brother had, and when I guess one that I had. How some of it happened. My brother was afraid all his life of going blind, so deeply that he would turn the dinner knives away from looking at him, he said, <laughs> as they lay on the kitchen table. He would throw a sweatshirt over those knobs that used to lock the car door from the inside, and once he dismantled a chandelier in the middle of the night when everyone was sleeping. We found the pile of sharp and shining crystals in the upstairs hall. So you understand, it was terrible. When they clamped his one eye open and put the needle in, up, and into his eye from underneath and left it there for a full minute before they drew it slowly out, once a week, for many weeks. He learned to lean into it, to settle down, he said, and still the eye went dead, ulcerated, breaking up green in his head as the other eye, still blue and wide open, looked and looked at the clock. My brother promised me he wouldn't die after our father died. He shook my hand on a train going home one Christmas and gave me five years. As clearly as he promised, he'd be home for breakfast when I watched him walk into that New York City autumn night. By nine, I promise. And he did come back. And five years later, he promised five years more. So much for the brave pride of premonition, the worry that won't let it happen. You know, he said, I always knew I would die young. And then I got sober and I thought, okay, I'm not. I'm going to see 30 and live to be an old man. And now it turns out that I am going to die. Isn't that funny? One day it happens. What you have feared all your life, the unendurably specific, the exact thing, no matter what you say or do. This is what my brother said. Here, sit closer to the bed so I can see you. I wanted to read you a poem by W.S. Merwin. Maybe you know his poems. It's a very short poem. It's called, For the Anniversary of My Death. 
Every year, without knowing it, I have passed the day when the last fires will wave to me, and the silence will set out tireless traveler like the beam of a lightless star. Then I will no longer find myself in life as in a strange garment, surprised at the earth and the love of one woman and the shamelessness of men, as today, writing after three days of rain, hearing the wren sing and the falling cease, and bowing, not knowing to what. Here's a poem called The Gate. I had no idea that the gate I would step through to finally enter this world would be the space my brother's body made. He was a little taller than me, a young man, but grown himself by then. Done at 28 having folded every sheet, rinsed every glass he would ever rinse under the cold and running water. This is what you have been waiting for, he used to say to me. And I would say, what? And he would say, this, holding up my cheese and mustard sandwich. And I would say, what? And he would say, this, sort of looking around. which was annoying sometimes. <laughs> you know, I'd be like, oh, I'm so mad at my boyfriend, blah, 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 blah. He's like, this is what you've been waiting for. I'm like, what? He goes, this. He lived with a Buddhist. He really did live with a Buddhist. Um, I want to read a, I want to read a poem by, oh, here. My dear friend, um, Jason Schinder was a poet who uh, died a few years ago. And um, we didn't think uh, Jason was facing his illness. Um, <laughs> we, we really were very concerned about this. Um, he, he refused to be sick, he would never go to bed, you know, he would, he would meet you for coffee and he would be like haggard, you know, he was you know, like stage four cancer and he'd be like, I don't know why I feel so bad. <laughs> and he'd be like, Jason, you have cancer. He goes, oh yeah, that must be it. Um, it was truly annoying. Um, he actually died standing up. He died standing up. He died leaving his house, standing up. And we, we, anyway, I can tell you a lot about our frustration with his not processing his illness enough with us. Um, in case anybody out there has ever had that experience. This went on for a couple of years. Anyway, he died. And in his will, he, he, told, he left, told four of us we had to put together his book. Tony Hoagland, me, and... Uh, Lucy Brock Broido and Sophie Cabot Black. And so we, there were hundreds of manuscripts, you know, poems everywhere, but he did have a main one, and I, I couldn't even read it for a couple of months. He was one of my best friends. It was, you know, it was unendurable that he was finally dead. Um, and anyway, finally I sat down with the manuscript and I began to read it. And I, I you know, I, I, what can I say? It was, I, turned out, turned out he was, he was actually thinking about it all along. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. What are you going to do? It's just everything. It's like what's the, what you're talking about stupidity, right? Be shown your own stupidity. Here's a poem called At Sunset. Anybody who knows Cape Cod knows that the, through a crazy uh, geographical uh, accident, um, the sun sets in the ocean. 
like it does in California because everything's turned around in Provincetown. So this is where this was, at sunset. Your death must be loved this much. You have to know the grief now, standing by the water's edge, looking down at the wave touching you. You have to lie stiff, arms folded, on a heap of earth, and see how far the darkness will take you. I mean it, this, now, before the ghost, the cold leaves in your breath rises, before the toes are put together inside the shoes. There it is, the goddamn orange going into rose descending circle of beauty and time. You have nothing to be sad about. I'm going to read that again. Jason, okay, at sunset. <clears throat> Your death must be loved this much. You have to know the grief now. Standing by the water's edge, looking down at the wave touching you, you have to lie stiff, arms folded on a heap of earth, and see how far the darkness will take you. I mean it. This, now, before the ghost, the cold leaves in your breath rises before the toes are put together in the shoes. There it is, the goddamn orange going into a rose descending circle of beauty and time. You have nothing to be sad about. Mwah. It's a, this is a great, great book. It's called Stupid Hope. <laughs> Isn't that good? <clears throat> um, Chodo asked me to read a poem, um, which I'm going to find, Chodo. No, I can't find it now. Um, by Tony Hoagland. Called Lucky. And it's sort of a poem uh, about the shadow, you know, the shadow that we would dis disavow. Aww. Maybe you guys can talk among yourselves for a minute. <laughs> Are you right there? Lucky, lucky. I folded it up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Lucky. <clears throat> well, it's not happening. It's not meant to be. I'm sorry. I hate it when people do this. <clears throat> it just, I don't know. It jumped, it jumped ship. Um, Okay, here's a, here's a poem, it's a, a new poem and, uh, that I wrote. It's, it's in the voice of Mary Magdalene. Let's hear it for Mary, right? <laughs> um, our sister, our sister. Um, Mary Magdalene, as we know, has been given a terrible bad rap that completely fictionalized um, by the church fathers, God bless them. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> All that we hear about her actually in the Bible is from Luke. Where he refers to Mary um, of Magdala from whom seven devils were driven. So I was thinking about her seven devils and what they might be. And um, she began to speak. So here she is. She's talking about those seven devils. Has anybody here ever been possessed by a devil? Sure. Well, listen to Mary. Maybe, maybe we'll feel differently about the devils after this. <clears throat> Magdalene, the seven devils. The first was that I was very busy. <laughs> the second, that I was different from you. Whatever happened to you could not happen to me. Not like that. 
The third, I worried. The fourth, envy, disguised as compassion. The fifth was that I refused to consider the quality of life of the aphid. The aphid disgusted me, <laughs> but I couldn't stop thinking about it. The mosquito too, its face, and the ant, its bifurcated body. Okay, the first was that I was so busy. The second, that I might make the wrong choice because I had decided to take that plane that day, that flight before noon, so as to arrive early, and I shouldn't have wanted that. The third was that if I walked past a certain place on the street, the house would blow up. The fourth was that I was made of guts and blood with a thin layer of skin lightly thrown over the whole thing. <laughs> the fifth was that the dead seemed more alive to me than the living. The sixth, if I touched my right arm, I had to touch my left arm. And if I touched the left arm a little harder than I'd first touched the right, then I had to retouch the left and then touch the right again so it would be even. The seventh was that I knew I was breathing the expelled breath of everything that was alive, and I couldn't stand it. I wanted a sieve, a mask, a, I hate this word, a cheesecloth to breathe through that would trap it, whatever was inside everyone else that entered me when I breathed in. No, that was the first one. The second was that I was so busy I had no time. How had this happened? How had our lives gotten like this? The third was that I couldn't eat food if I really saw it distinct, separate from me in a bowl or on a plate. Okay. The first was that I could never get to the end of the list. The second was that the laundry was never finally done. The third was that no one knew me, although they thought they did, and that if people thought of me as little as I thought of them, then what was love? The fourth was that I didn't belong to anyone. I wouldn't allow myself to belong to anyone. The fifth was that I knew none of us could ever know what we didn't know. The sixth was that I projected onto others what I myself was feeling. The seventh was the way my mother looked when she was dying, the sound she made, the gurgling sound so loud we had to speak louder to hear each other over it. No, no, not the sound. It was that years later I couldn't stop hearing it, grocery shopping, crossing the street. Her body's hunger, finally evident, what our mother had hidden all her life. For months I dreamt of knuckle bones and roots, slabs of sidewalk pushed up like crooked teeth by what grew underneath, the underneath. That was the first devil. It was always with me. And that I didn't think you, if I told you about it, would understand any of this. And I'm going to finish with a poem um, written as a kind of letter to my brother, and it's called What the Living Do. And thank you so much for your company. What the Living Do. <clears throat> Johnny. The kitchen sink has been clogged for days. Some utensil probably fell down there, <clears throat> and the Drano won't work, but smells dangerous. And the crusty dishes have piled up, waiting for the plumber I still haven't called. This is the every day we spoke of. It's winter again. The sky is a deep, headstrong blue, and the sunlight pours through the open living room windows because the heat's on too high in here and I can't turn it off. For weeks now, 
driving, or dropping a bag of groceries in the street, the bag breaking. I've been thinking, this is what the living do. And yesterday, hurrying along those wobbly bricks in the Cambridge sidewalk, spilling my coffee down my wrist and sleeve, I thought it again, and again later, when buying a hairbrush. This is it, parking, slamming the car door shut in the cold, what you called that yearning, what you finally gave up. We want the spring to come and the winter to pass. We want whoever to call or not call, a letter, a kiss. We want more and more and then more of it. But there are moments walking when I catch a glimpse of myself in the window glass, say the window of the corner video store, and I'm gripped by a cherishing so deep from my own blowing hair, chapped face, and unbuttoned coat that I'm speechless. I am living. I remember you. Thank you. Should I do a little baby encore? Yes. <laughs> well, here's, this is what occurs to me since we had the first snow during the nor'easter that came after the storm. Um, and the last time I was up around here, I was at a, another monastery called Holy Cross. Has anyone ever been there? Across the river? Um, <clears throat> I love the stories of the Old and New Testament, as you can tell, um, very much. And, I love the story of uh, when Jesus um, <clears throat> dies and then when his, his students think they see him again, and maybe they did, who knows, um, and they tell everybody about it. One of them wasn't there that day, Thomas, remember? When, and, and he says, yeah, sure, um, sure you saw him. But it's the way it is after someone you love dies, right? You keep thinking you see them on the street, or you think you see them on the bus, or you think you just, you know? Um, so Thomas, Thomas says, I'll believe it when I can put my hand in his wounds, then I'll believe it. So of course the next night Jesus appears and says what is quoted in this poem to Thomas. But this is a little poem called The Snowstorm. I walk down toward the river and the deer had left tracks. Half, I'm sorry, let me start over again. The snowstorm. I walked down towards the river and the deer had left tracks deep as half my arm that ended in a perfect hoof. And the shump shump sound my boots made walking made the silence loud. And when I turned back toward the great house, I walked beside the deer tracks again and when I came near the feeder, little tracks of the birds on the surface of the snow I'd broken through. Put your finger here and see my hands. Then bring your hand and put it into my side. I put my hand down into the, into the deer track and touched the bottom of an invisible hoof then my finger and the little mark of the J. Thank you. <laughs>